Um, yeah, this is our seventh year, and we thought it was about time we looked at language. Next year is disability and art, just so people can get organised for that. After that, I don't know what will happen. I need someone else to maybe step up to the plate and do this after eight years. I think someone else can maybe have a go at it. But uh, it's clearly shown that Disability History Month is necessary. What are we about in Disability History Month? We're about rediscovering our past. We're about learning about the treatment of disabled people over the centuries around the world. And we're looking at our achievements. And we're looking at what we still have to do to achieve equality in our world. And uh, I think all of those issues are live issues still for disabled people and for all people. In the times we live in now, a few months ago, I couldn't understand how we went in the 1930s towards the popularism and fascism. I can now. We're seeing it in America. We're seeing it in Europe. It is happening. And we all have a responsibility to do something about it. Remember, Hitler was elected by the German people. That didn't mean anything because he burned down the parliament building afterwards. So democracy can be used against itself. And we've just seen that in America. I believe we saw it in Britain over Brexit as well, uh, because I don't think people were informed what that was. For eight years, I represented disabled people in Britain on the European Disability Forum. And we got an amazing amount of things out of Europe. Disabled people benefited enormously, as we did on the environment, as the regions did. And yet, a region like Wales that got huge amounts of subsidy voted to come out. There was no sense in all of this. So I agree with Michelin that we have to understand our history better in order that people are more informed to make better choices and decisions. So on disabled people, let's go back to ancient Greece. The Greeks believed in two sides uh, of people, that beauty had two forms. Uh, kalos, meaning beautiful, body beautiful, symmetry good, and kakos, meaning bad, grotesque, asymmetrical, and ugly. So we have the body beautiful, the discus thrower, Venus, and so on. And a, a, a statue there who's not really meant to be disabled, he's just disabled by age, I think. It's a four and off a bit. Uh, and then on the other side, grotesques were also part of the reminders the Greeks made to themselves about these two parts of humanity. And this dichotomy has really come down to us through the ages. Uh, and we see it all the time in the way that uh, people are forced to aspire to one narrow image of what is normal, what is beautiful. Uh, and that, of course, excludes most people. But it is very useful to play on people's insecurities to sell products to them, which is what actually happens. It was used also by Goddard, who was a nun of the eugenicists that we've heard about, to construct false science again of this idea that this guy who came along, he dallied one night with a barmaid who was bad genes, and he had, according to Goddard, 400 progeny who were all bad, and then he made a good marriage after his dalliance with a good Quaker woman, and all of that offspring were good, solid citizens. This is all nonsense and lies, and actually he said it himself 10 years after. But by the time he'd said that, 37 states in the United States were compulsory sterilizing disabled people. So these ideas and language has enormous impact on our lives. So the next one I want to look at is some of the words that are used. The word cripple, which is an offensive word which we don't like. I was called a cripple at school. I'm also a paleo survivor. Uh, but this painting, 400 years old by Bruegel, is also called the cripples. And these uh, people with prophecies uh, have foxtails attached to their back to show how evil they are. Um, in Holland, in 1600, the good burgomasters and mistresses were asked to give out uh, arms, ALMS, to the penitent sinners. Because they got leprosy, they had obviously sinned. And this idea that if you've done something wrong, you get a punishment from a deity is a very powerful idea not just in our society, but throughout the world, where I've done work on inclusion, i found the same ideas, whether it be in Papua New Guinea, Africa, or India, or indeed South America. The same ideas are there. So we haven't really, apart from a bit on the surface, moved on. Then, with figures of fun, this is a recreation of uh, my, uh, a theatre of people with learning difficulties of Henry VIII's time, where he had fools 
uh, natural fools, as he called them, i.e. people who were born with a learning difficulty, because the Tudors believed that they had a direct line to God and would never lie. So the king liked to surround himself with people. Well, it's a job creation scheme for people with learning difficulties at that time. But, uh, you know, it also led to them being seen as jesters or jokers. Or else people who were different from other people had to make their living by allowing people to come and look at them. Now this is a very competent man who could write, who could uh, do all sorts of things, but he had to make his living through allowing people to come and look at him because he was so different from everybody else. So this idea of freakery, of we are as a curiosity, is another thing. And of course that goes on particularly for people who are other or dangerous, who were decided from 12, 50 onwards, were locked up in places like Bedlam. Uh, and it's really, I would say, people without speech and people with mental health issues are probably two of the groups, people learning difficulties, who are least included in the rights that we've managed to get for disabled people. And it's clear that we haven't managed to get them for all people because these old ideas still come in. And of course, uh, Lee has already mentioned the eugenics, but that's a good example of a poster used in Prussia in 1937 of the cost of educating the useless eaters, uh, or the Untermensch. Uh, and this was up on billboards all over Germany, which allowed people to give up their children uh, for mercy killing, as Hitler called it, uh, annihilation, more than one million over the greater German Reich. Um, but of course we didn't always just accept this. We've always resisted. I told a story this morning, uh, no I didn't, but I'll tell it now, of a, of a leper colony in Norfolk where the abbot was very mean to the lepers and wouldn't uh, give them their portion of charity that they'd come to expect. Uh, in a place called Somerton in Norfolk, and so they rebelled, burned down the leper house and attacked uh, all their uh, prisoners for treating them badly. So resistance has always been part of our existence against the oppression put upon us. These uh, disabled veterans from the First World War were very proud and refused to be called uh, and joined something called the League of the Brave Young Things and said, no, we are handicapped, because at that time it was a positive word. We've gone on since to say, no, we don't actually like the word handicap. But at that time it was. Or, um, over on the other side here, a, a march to Trafalgar Square of blind, unemployed workers fighting for the right to work and a decent wage, the same as everybody else, because they were doing the same work. Now, they had three marches that converged on London, and indeed, in the end, they did get the 1920 Blind Act, but just to show they were outside their place in society, they were attacked in Trafalgar Square by mounted police on a blind person's march. Quite hard to believe, but it happened. Or well, here, an advert about Europe again, during the Maastricht talks, how did the Guardian, interesting, we're in their building, uh, portray uh, Britain, Great Britain, as a wrecked person in a wheelchair, because of course, if you're in a wheelchair, it's a metaphor for uselessness. Is it? We don't think so. But they put it forward. And here we have seven uh, activists from North London who came up and held up their signs saying, women in wheelchairs are powerful, the Guardian has got it wrong. And cartoonists throughout time, particularly in the 18th century, have used our outer image to make general political points. And it's a very important literary language or graphic language that is used. Another place that we hit back was Telethon. We've just had Children in Need, which uh, I found some of the coverage pretty appalling in terms of not rights, but we all have to give more and more money for children who should be getting these rights. Uh, but in 1991, some people here I can see who were on it, we had a, a, a shutdown of London Weekend Television. It was the second one, and uh, they no longer put it on because there was too much pressure on them. And then, of course, people with learning difficulties have said, we think jars should be labelled, not people. So we've had all of this resistance as part of our language. Perhaps the real change from all of those millennia came when a number of disabled people, particularly in the UK, got together, the Union of Physically Impaired Against Segregation, and uh, particularly a man called Paul Hunt, you can read on some of the shows that are going on in there, more about him, wrote a letter to the Guardian again, and said, I am a successor, uh, rough quote, of the 
Monday workhouse. For those who would like to have a different way of living, he lived in a Leonard Cheshire home, by the way, I would like them to join with me. And from that came the movement in our country to try and repostulate how we should be. And they began to distinguish between our impairment, which is our loss or limitation of physical or sensory impairment, which is part of the human condition, and the disability, which is the loss or limitation of opportunity to take part in a normal life due to things beyond us, the barriers, the sorts of things that Penn was talking about. If you cut back sign language, well then you can turn around and say, well, deaf people can't do anything, because you take away their means of communication. So, reclaiming disabled people is one of the things we've done. In the UK, the right word to use for disabled people is disabled people, not people with disabilities. Because if you call us people with disabilities, it's like we're the people with the barriers. And we can't be the people with the barriers because the barriers are coming from beyond us. They never understood that in the United States, and so that is now the language of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. But it's wrong, and we know it's wrong. But, you know, we will keep fighting for disabled people. What holds us together is solidarity, whatever our impairments, against the oppression that we face in society. So, yes, yeah, so, uh, okay. Having an impairment is part of the human condition. Being disabled is a social construct. Throughout time, everywhere in the world, people develop impairments. Some people are born with them, some people acquire them. But, you can bet that is part of the condition, and most people here will acquire an impairment before they die. That's also true, and we have a real problem about actually looking at disabled people in old age. Actually, at 80, 80% 80 of our population are disabled people. Do they get disabled people's rights? No way do they get disabled people's rights. They're just old people. So that's going to be another battle that I think probably our generation will fight as we get older and older. And say, no, we are disabled people, and we are old people, and we have rights. So this uh, change, really, which we characterise as a shift from the medical model, which sees the problem in us, to seeing the problem in society, is a fundamental paradigm shift. And really, if you think, in 1981 that was adopted following the work in the 1970s in Britain by Disabled People International. It was only 25 years later, in the United Nations, and I was privileged to be there representing the UK Disabled People's Movement, we were able to get this model across and into the International Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. See, we didn't win the language. But we did win the idea, and that's the important thing. So, language is power, or it's disempowerment. We've heard some of the language we don't like, I'm not going to go through these, this is not a, about political correctness, it's just wrong, most of this language on the left-hand side. It doesn't apply. We're not handicapped or crippled, we're not idiots, retards, moms, imbeciles, victims, sufferers, vulnerable, favourite one with politicians today, deaf or dumb, nutters, maniacs, insane, crazy, spastics or spaz, autistic, hyperactive, aspergers. What we are is neurodiverse people, persons with cerebral palsy, persons with mental health, deaf or deaf of persons, disabled people, persons with learning difficulties, what was that from? Uh, <laughs> Person with physical impairments, but all of us, including the deaf community, are in the end part of the disabled people's movement, and we are fighting a common battle. Of course, some people never understood this, even though he had a disabled child himself, and he did very well with his disabled child, but it didn't stop him taking a hammer to crack uh, a peanut, really. And we're still suffering with that 30 million pounds, billion pounds of cuts further on. Uh, many suicides, people who have actually had their benefits withdrawn, and an appalling situation that we have continued to protest about, but really not acceptable. So we live in a world where if you triumph over the tragedy of disability, you become a superhuman on Channel 4. But what about the rest of us? Are we underhumans or lesser humans because we are not superhumans, because we choose not to or don't want to go? to the Paralympics. Should all disabled people be measured by Paralympians? I don't think so. There are 11 and a half million of us, and I don't think we all want to be seen like that. For those people who want to do it, that's fine. Or should we all be seen as the government would like us to see? As scroungers, 75% of us are work shy. We're really not capable of having this. Or the not quite deserving call. These are the language that was used today to describe us. And it has an impact. 
it leads to death on the streets. Particularly youth, often disabled youth themselves, attack other people and kill them. In the last eight years, more than 20 murders on the streets, 47% of disabled people don't feel it's safe to go out on the streets, and these are just a few of the cases that have been coming on. How does it work? Well, you start by saying, well, these people, are, they're not, not in our group, they're different to us. Uh, then you can start calling them names, you can treat them badly, you can uh, do, uh, go on the internet and make fun of them. Uh, you can do all of these things, and in the end, it does lead to dehumanising people and death. So we have this charter, we agree, this convention of the UN, which is based on this paradigm shift, 167 countries have now signed up to it, which is great. One of the things in it is independence. That's one of the words that people get most confused about for disabled people. What are we independent of? It doesn't mean doing everything for ourselves. It doesn't mean being placed in a home. It doesn't mean being in an institution. It doesn't mean being segregated. It doesn't mean guardianship. It does not mean having insufficient income to live upon. What it means is independence, is choice and control over what happens to us. Not doing it for ourselves, but having choice and control. Having barriers removed in all areas of life. Support and reasonable adjustments until all those barriers are removed. The ideal would be universal design, so everybody's needs are met, but we're a long way from that. Supported decision making instead of guardianship. And that's one that Britain is not meeting its international obligations on. Uh, Person-centred approaches and the right to a family life. There are still many, many disabled people who are having their children taken away from them because social services don't believe they will be fit parents. Is it not cheaper and more efficient and effective to support that family rather than taking the children away and putting them into care? And yet this is everyday decision that is being taken. So, in the end, it's about involving us in all parts of what's going on. And do you know why? We're not involved because the government refused to give money to disabled people's organisations so that we can have a proper voice. So who are they to talk to when the convention says they have to talk to us? Well, they talk to tame organisations. I don't know why they not, I've just got two to go. Um, in education, inclusion is not integration. This is a portrait, uh, you'll see initially myself and others in there, who fought over the last 25 years for inclusion. But it's amazing, Jeremy Corbyn was saying, uh, when I met him in my constituency last week, that they're consulting with people in the Northwest, disabled people, about what we want for the future. An enormous number of disabled people said, no, no, we don't want to be in a mainstream school. Because what they experienced was bullying and integration. What they didn't experience was inclusion where their needs were met. And that is what we have to fight for. Labour Party are now saying we want inclusion, not segregation. We need to educate them to understand that that means inclusion and not integration. It means getting rid of much of the exam apparatus that has been set the lead tables, and developing a curriculum that meets the needs of all who can demonstrate their potential in whatever way is necessary. <laughs> last slide, well, last but one. Uh, so, a number of people in DIPAP uh, gathered a lot of data and sent it to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. They came and had an investigation, and they have found that there are grave and systematic violations of disabled people's human rights. These are important words. They're the way we're portrayed negatively in the media, dependence on making a living out of benefit, committing fraud is being blown out of all proportion, a disproportionately applied getting people off support allowance, a whole series of things. And as you can see there, disabled people have borne the brunt of the cuts. So I'll end on this. We need to keep protesting need to celebrate on this slide's remembrance of Debbie Jolly, who was one of the founders of Disabled People Against the Cuts. It was she who gathered much of the information, which the UN Committee didn't just accept, it cross-checked it with 2,000 other sources in the UK, and yet ministers have been going out all over the place saying, oh, it's all nonsense, we're very nice to disabled people in this country. Well, just talk to any disabled person, you'll find that people, we don't think that they are very nice to us, and it's about time that people uh, got the right language, 
but also got the message behind the language is that we need solidarity from all of you. We need to take this message out for this year's Disability History Month across the country. We've got lots of events happening. That language does matter, but behind the language comes the thought about our rights to be as human as everybody else. And that's why this month is important. Thank you. Thank you.